And now on for our dinosaur of the day, Edmontonia, which was a request from Damien via Facebook. So thanks, Damien. It's named after the Edmonton Formation, now the Horseshoe Canyon Formation in Canada, where it was found. And it's part of the Notosaur family. It lived in the late Cretaceous. Charles Sternberg named the type species Edmontonia longiceps in 1928. And longiceps means long-headed in Latin. Hmm. Sternberg did not classify Edmontonia, and L.S. Russell classified it as Notosauridae in 1930, which has been confirmed. George Patterson, the teamster on an expedition that Charles Sternberg led, found Edmontonia in 1924 on that expedition. And he found a skull, lower right jaw, and a lot of the postcranial skeleton, including the armor. Barnum Brown found a different species, Edmontonia rugosidens, in 1915 in Alberta, Canada, and sent it to the American Museum of Natural History, though it wasn't yet named. William Diller Matthew referred that specimen to Paleosoniscus in 1922 in a Popular Science article without naming the species. It was supposed to name a new species in conjunction with Brown, but the article wasn't actually published. And Matthew also referred to another specimen found by Levi Sternberg in 1917. Then in 1930, Charles Gilmore referred both of these specimens to Paleosynchus rugosidens, based on a type specimen found in 1928 by George Fryer Sternberg. And the species name, rugosidens, means rough tooth. In 1940, Laurie Shano Russell referred all three specimens, though, to Edmontonia rugosidens. So, there are two main Edmontonia species— the type species, Edmontonia longiceps and Edmontonia rugosidens, which, in addition to the Paleosynchus, had its own genus for a while called Chasternbergia, named by Bob Bakker as a subgenus in 1988, based on it lived before Edmontonia longiceps and it had a different skull proportion. But then George Olszewski gave it the full generic name in 1991. And that name honors Charles Chas Sternberg through this subgenus genus name that's rarely applied. But later finds have been referred to as uh, Edmontonia rugosidens. In 1971, Walter Preston Combs Jr. renamed the two Edmontonia species to Panoplosaurus, but then the name Edmontonia was later revived. There's been other species, like Edmontonia schlissmani, originally was Denversaurus schlissmani until 1992, and then Edmontonia australis, named in 2000 by Tracy Lee Ford, though now that's considered to be a junior synonym of Glyptodontelmimus. Gregory Paul suggested in 2010 that Edmontonia rugosidens was a direct ancestor of Edmontonia longiceps, which was a direct ancestor of Edmontonia schlissmani. So Edmontonia was bulky and like a tank. It's about 22 feet or 6.6 meters long, though Gregory Paul estimated in 2010 that two of the Edmontonia species, Longiceps and Rugosidens, were about 20 feet or 6 meters long and weighed 3 tons. It had a pear-like shaped skull when viewed from above, and its body had many osteoderms, and the plates protected its neck and shoulders. It had small bony plates on its back and head and sharp spikes along its sides, and the four largest spikes were on its shoulders. And in Edmontonia rugosidens, the second set of spikes on its shoulders split into subspines. And in Edmontonia longiceps, the spikes were relatively small. The size of the spikes in Edmontonia rugosidens varied a bit more. The shoulder spikes had solid bases. And they probably had large spikes to attract mates or defend territory, or also to intimidate rivals or predators or for self-defense. The shoulder spikes... Wouldn't have been a great defense, though, since they only covered the shoulders, so they're probably not great against large theropods like Albertosaurus. Spikes could have been like horns, where Edmontonia locked them to show dominance. Kenneth Carpenter described traits of Edmontonia in 1990 by comparing it with close relative Panaplosaurus. The snout had parallel sides, the skull armor was smooth on the surface and had shorter neural arches and neural spines than Panaplosaurus. Carpenter also showed how two of the Edmontonia species were different. Edmontonia rugosidens did not have sideways projecting osteoderms behind its eye sockets, and Edmontonia longiceps did not have an ossified cheek plate. The skull was up to 1.6 feet or 0.5 meters long and elongated with a horny upper beak, and they had a paranasal tract that ran along the outside of the nasal cavity. This is the first time found in a notosaurid, but not an ankylosaurid, which had more complex air tracts. They may have stayed low to the ground to prevent predators from flipping them over and attacking their underbelly. 
They did not have a tail club like ankylosaurids, and they had a narrower mouth than ankylosaurids. Edmontonia appeared in Dinosaurs Unextinct at the LA Zoo, which is a new exhibit that opened April 15th and ran through October 31st of this year. It was also at the LA County Fair this year, which ended in September, and it was part of an exhibit at the North Carolina Aquarium this year, which also ended in September. Wow, it was really making the rounds. It was. <laughs> so again, Edmontonia is part of Notosauridae, and that's a family of ankylosaurs, and they lived in the late Jurassic to late Cretaceous in what is now North America, Europe, Asia, and Antarctica. They were medium to large and heavy, and they were quadrupedal herbivores with osteoderms on their bodies. Yeah, you've probably seen Edmontonia a lot. It's the notosaur that has the really big spikes kind of sticking out of the front of its shoulders and not so much on the rest of its body. That's kind of the big characteristic look, at least when I look at it. And it's got the flexible tail without a club, so it's not quite as exciting as ankylosaurus, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> You're a bit biased, though. I am. 